Um, how are we all doing? Good? Uh, I'm Haven Lynn Kirk. I'm the area head for design here at the Roski School of Art and Design. Brand new name, too. Um, I'd like to first off thank everyone for coming out tonight for the Roski Talk lecture series and our special guest, Michael Lejeune from Metro. Um, it's a privilege for me to introduce tonight's guest because I've known him for a number of years, huh? <laughs> first through, well, not first through AIJA, primarily through AIJA LA's board of director where he was the chapter's president for a number of years, but more importantly as the incredibly creative head of the 30 person in-house design studio of LA Metro. Um, over the course of numerous years as an LA resident, I've watched uh, Michael and his uber creative team um, literally changed the Los Angeles landscape. Um, the Metro Design Studio creates advertisement, wayfinding, commercials, uh, environmental graphics, maps, a slew of other collaterals, media, bus and rail fleet, graphics for web and mobile um, environments, and merchandising. Did I get everything, Michael? There's probably more, more or less, yes. Um, the work that he and his team have created have been featured in AIGA's design archive, the New York Times, LA Times, Communication Arts, Creative Review, Fast Company, Print, How, LA Magazine, and so much more. Um, their work has also been featured as part of the Hammer Museum's Graphic Design Now in Production um, exhibition in 2012, a couple years back. And in our, in our car-centric city, Michael has managed to do something truly monumental. He's made public transportation cool, <laughs> finally. So please join me tonight in welcoming my dear friend and most esteemed colleague, Michael Lejeune. Thank you so much. If I was really a bad teacher, I'd make you all move up front. But can everybody see, first of all? Okay, sorry. I was supposed to do that. All right, all off, is that it? Let's try that and see. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Um, I believe, so, so I've done a number of talks around the country, which has been really fun. It's such a pleasure as a LA native to be able to go and tell a different story about LA than the one that most people think of, you know, we're a really easy target, right? You know, nobody walks in LA, it's nothing but traffic, et cetera. So, uh, but, but I, I'm not so used to an LA audience. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can adjust and try not to make so many obvious jokes. Um, but I also believe, especially with um, students who I'm sort of looking around the room and guessing that most of you are students, um, I believe in trying to deliver some value. So the way that I'm um, sort of structuring it, this is to try to, give you um, a couple of ideas, tips, or lessons along the way for when you get out into the world. I assume you all want to be actually paid to be designers as opposed to just doing it as a hobby. Um, so, you know, you'll get the idea as we roll through. There's lots of eye candy, but um, my, my thoughts and suggestions uh, about being a practicing designer um, will be built around um, you know, metro uh, projects and such, um, but I think you'll be able to extrapolate for whatever you are interested in or want to do. And at the same time, I'm hoping to kind of uh, tell the tale of what's happening in LA, which is really, uh, to me, incredibly exciting. Um, so I'll blaze through it, because I worked on it, and it's in order and like that. And then, um, and then I would love to have uh, more conversation and questions and that sort of thing uh, afterwards. Um, I, I will warn you, I'm a big fan of the incredibly cheesy animations in keynotes. So I had fun uh, the other night going through and picking all kinds of silliness for, um, for this talk. Um, anyway, hi, uh, I'm Michael Lejeune. I, uh, I've been at Metro now as the first and thus far only creative director. Oh, it's a big building. I haven't really looked around, but I think I'm the only one. Nobody else is, seems to be doing what I'm doing. Um, for 12 years, which is a long time, I'm, and um, I'm still doing it because I love it very much and because there's no end to the challenge and the breadth of our work, and, and we never know what's coming next because you know, Metro and, and the work we're doing is evolving just like the system and like Los Angeles itself. Um, so we'll jump right in. Here we go. Uh, do you love that? Do you want to see it again? I'll do it twice. <laughs> a, 
a little bit of history. I think it's important um, for the for the youngsters in the audience to um, to know where we came from in LA. We were once the envy of the nation. This is um, beautiful Union Station, downtown LA. Happily, it looks just like this, uh, pretty much today. Not so many orange trees in the parking lot, and the cars are different. But um, it really is a beautiful space that that remains to this day. And also, happily for us, Metro bought Union Station last year, so we own the store, if you will. And that's a that's a really terrific opportunity. Union Station is uh, 75 years old this year, and. Um, a quick and shameless plug on May uh, 3rd, I think, of this coming year. There will be, on a Saturday, there'll be a day-long celebration with all kinds of cool um, bands and musical acts. Uh, it's National Train Day at Union Station. You can take tours of historic trains. There'll be lots of booths and, and food and, and people playing drums and all kinds of stuff. So just sort of stick that in the back of your mind. So Union Station was the hub for for transit in Los Angeles. And people would, you know, there were no airports in 1939, really, to speak of, or commercial travel. So people would take the train out and walk out the front door and smell orange blossoms and say, I'm here and I'm never, ever leaving. And it was quite wonderful. We also, as some of you may know, had uh, one of the most um, comprehensive and successful transportation systems in the United States in the red car and yellow car um, system. And here we see from an unidentified date, but you can see how, how peacefully uh, and pleasantly coexisting the car traffic is with um, with red cars traveling around, um, and you see some foothills in the background, and it was just wonderful. Um, and then uh, after World War II, um, uh, LA started to spread out. The suburbs became the place to be, and you could buy your two bedroom house for maybe twelve, thirteen thousand dollars somewhere out out in the environments. And one of the things that started happening was that the uh, sort of rise of the car began to take hold. And we certainly had help from car manufacturers and from tire makers. But you know, advertisements like this, doesn't everybody live this way with two convertibles and the incredible you know, uh, case study house? And of course, you're wearing your, your tuxedo to dinner. You know, um, It's all so sophisticated and, and wonderful. And so this was kind of the way uh, you know, cars and car culture were really fostered and born uh, here in LA. Um, and about this time, uh, the, the ridership began to drop a little bit on that wonderful red car system. Um, and ultimately, the red cars were sadly dismantled, and um, and we lost that amazing and comprehensive transportation system for a number of years. Um, I don't think I have to explain the symbolism of this one, but if if you want to ask me later, you can see me privately. Um, but but you know, cars were sexy. Cars were the thing that everybody wanted, and and there was a major push to to sell that idea. Even today. This is the $100,000 Tesla um, convertible, you know, and you're driving around LA and you're not emitting and it's all so incredibly groovy, but it's still this idea that, you know, single driver in his element or her element in, in the car. Um, when I was a kid um, growing up in LA, I remember um, freeways feeling like this, and this particular, this is the uh, four stack as you enter downtown Los Angeles. This is the way it always seemed to me, whoosh, 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 moving fast. Um, if you were ever in a traffic jam, something was really, really wrong, and it was highly unusual. And I sort of have this picture in my head from growing up of being in the back, what we call the backity back of my family's station wagon, coming home from the beach or Santa Barbara or someplace else and I would be looking up at the lights passing and you know sort of dozing off to sleep and it kind of felt like this to me you know it felt like uh, we were going fast and it was an adventure all the time the trouble is that this is really the reality in Los Angeles uh, now this is the 10 freeway this is by the way an unretouched photo um, and in fact this was my commute this very stretch of freeway was my commute for probably uh, close to 10 years and um, I, was, I found myself spending about an hour in the car each way, so much time in the car that I would hear the same NPR stories twice, which is really sad and kind of depressing because you realize, wow, I'm, I'm in a kind of a Groundhog Day thing and I'm not even home yet. Um, and so this is really what it is to, you know, what, what it has been, I should say, um, over the last uh, you know, decade or so, the reality of what it's like to 
commute in Los Angeles. Um, in, in fact, there's a study um, that's done by a, a, a transportation institute in Texas every year, looks at LA, or, uh, uh, cities in the United States, and through a matrix of, you know, time lost and average speeds and pollution factors and whatever else, they named the worst city in the country for traffic. Um, and LA has had that dubious honor not once, not twice, not five times, 25 years in a row. And, you know, it got to be this very sad joke that, oh great, we won again, you know. Um, however, good news, last year Chicago displaced Los Angeles as the worst traffic in a metropolitan area in the nation. So we take that as a good sign. But, you know, rather than that sort of freewheeling, uh, lights blurring, you know, moving all the time feeling of the, of the 40s and 50s when the great LA freeway system sprung up and was, was being constructed. As I said, this is really what it's more like. But we at Metro have a different idea. Um, and in fact, that's, that's the charge of Metro as, a, as, as the LA County's transportation builder and planner is, and operator is, why can't getting to work feel more like this? You know, what if you're uh, in a light field train and you're able to turn around and talk to somebody and meet somebody new without, you know, crashing? Um, you know, why can't the center of our um, uh, transportation network uh, be this, in fact, which is, which is what it is and will be over the next 25 years at Union Station? Um, you know, why can't, instead of looking for that space in a gray parking lot um, that's, you know, seven stories tall, why can't you pass through something like this, which is one of our new stations on the gold line on the east side? And if you're taking a bus, what if it feels like this? Uh, this is the orange line in the valley, and this is, again, a mostly unretouched photo. This is really what a stretch of that feels like with a bike path right, right alongside it and, uh, you know, zero scape planting. And, oh, look, there's a couple bikes right there on the front, which means people are going to get off that bus and get on their bike and be on their way. That's what we're after. Um, that's kind of the vision. And... Um, Day to day, that's really what we keep in our minds as we're doing everything from the mundane to the really exciting in terms of creating the visual vocabulary that communicates this. Um, here goes one. There you go. Um, so Haven said, be sure and tell them how you work, you know, because one day you will be in a, in a setting. And I think when sometimes when we graduate from school, we have a, a very rosy picture of an incredibly modern office space with brushed aluminum everything and, you know, smoked glass and, and uh, a cappuccino machine and all that stuff. Well, in fact, that's our front door right there, uh, down a, uh, on the 19th floor of, a, of an office building, which actually has an incredibly beautiful sort of retro-designed lobby. The, M the Metro headquarters in downtown right next to Union Station uh, has some beautiful public art murals in the lobbies, and if you get a chance, go and see that. But if you happen to find your way up to the 19th floor, you're going to feel like you could be anywhere in the world in an, in a, you know, in an office building. However, you know, so it's very humble. It's the public dollar. Um, we're not fancy, but you know, when you get inside, and, and when you get inside, at one point uh, before I started there. People would come and find their way past that door, and they would be faced with a bell, just like this one, on a counter. And the way that they asked for help design communication materials is they would ring the bell. And somebody would you know, sort of saunter out of their seat and mosey up to the counter and say, can I help you? And they'd say, I need, I need a brochure, and here's my floppy disk, and there's a Word document on there, and one photo, I think, and I like red, and can you make this brochure for me? So we blew up the bell. We installed our own art on the walls, and you know now we have uh, a very active space um, with our own conference room, and it's still Cubicleville, but um, we just make a grand mess all the time. You know, we are all about pinning up just the way you do now. You know, some things don't change. There's nothing beats a corkboard wall and lots and lots of visual reference. We labor over language. We write, you know, a hundred headlines to get to one. Um, we make messes and we mark things up and, you know, this is all real study from real things. I, I love this photo because we think about the web and ones and zeros. Well, guess what? This is the architecture of our website as we reapproached it a couple of years ago. And 
it still had to be pinned up with scotch tape on you know foam core boards. Um, so we we do this kind of stuff just as you would. We have a system. We open jobs. We track things. We use a database. It, you know, all of that is very much kind of the, the workings of what we do. And you'll probably find wherever you land that there will be some form of this. You might have some smoke glass, you might actually have a cappuccino machine, but uh, more often if you're gonna join, say, an in-house group like, uh, like the group at Metro, you're gonna sort of be within a great big beast. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't find ways to instill it with your own personality, and there's always a certain buzz and energy when you put two or more designers together in a space. And um, we definitely, we are definitely the place where people walk through those fire doors and think like, "Oh my God, I'm in Oz now!" You know, the music is playing. There's stuff all over the walls. People are buzzing, and it's it's the floor right above us is accounting. And the contrast is unbelievable between you know what we're doing on 19 and and the people who who get us paid actually on 20. We, we love them, but it's 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 different. Um, so, first lesson is humble will work for you because it's not as you'll see when we start getting into some of the work. It's not about your surroundings so much. It's about what comes from within you and how you service your organization and how you create for your company or your clients. Um, and to that effect, um, the first thing that we did when we when I started, I started uh, and, and at the same time uh, as my first day was the first day of an art director that came along with me, hired independently, and we ended up getting sort of thrown together to work together. And he was this very um, uh, clippy, super smart, very efficient Brit named Neil Sadler. And um, while I took to taking meetings with all kinds of people all over the building and learning about uh, what the client's needs were and figuring out our staffing and all that. Neil sort of set off in Metro World, which is certainly much, much more than the building. We have 10,000 employees. We have 20 different division yards all over where the buses get parked and fixed. And we have rail yards and um, different customer centers and places all over LA County. And Neil went and looked, took a look around. And I say take a look around because when you land in a work environment, a company, or for clients, the first thing you want to do before you jump in and say, what if we do this, is take the time to do your research, take the time to understand the way your company works, and literally take a look around. Neil took a look around and he found, oh, this is what our, our, our bus fleet looks like. These are our you know, on-street ambassadors from 10 years ago. And they were all over LA, and they were white, like every delivery truck, or gardener's truck, or pickup truck, or rental car, you know. And we sort of thought, hmm, they're blending in with the landscape. They're kind of disappearing into the, street, the, the active streetscape of LA. And yet, we want to raise Metro's profile and have more and more people in LA be aware of their options in public transportation. So this was sort of a before of, of you know, 2,000 buses that drive all over LA every day. And Neil, in taking a look around, discovered that we have a paint shop. In fact, right across the street from where our building is, there's this paint shop. And when buses get in a fender bender, which you can imagine they would, driving eight hours a day, um, or it's time for them to get something fixed, or they've reached their half-life and they're going to get their engine changed out, they come in and they get painted again, too. Well. If we can paint them white, right, for almost the same cost, we can develop our completely unique and new uh, fleet design. So this is what those white buses became. This is a this is rather an older bus, but a super bright color. This we named California Poppy, um, with some with some skirting on the top and bottom and silver to give it that sort of sleek look that recalled trains a little bit. Um, some very big badging. We renamed the the local service to be local uh, to be Metro Local, which was made sense to us and sounded friendly to to our customers. Um, the rapid service, sorry, the rapid service is called rapid, and those buses are super bright and shiny. And now you probably take this for granted, but I, I, I'm certain that all of you at some point or another have been standing on the street and looked down a street and seen a metro bus coming from far away because they're they're bright and they're colorful and they announce themselves now. Um, we actually are the only uh, transit agency in the country to have our own matchbox buses. Uh, and we didn't, this was not our idea. Um, a friend of mine called me about six years ago and said, I'm at Target, I'm buying this cool bus, you guys are amazing, you've got, you've got Matchbox buses. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And she said, no, you, 
you have Matchbox buses. There's an orange one, and there's a red one, and there's a blue one. And I said, no, 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 we, that, that's not possible. And she brought it home to give to my son. And the next day, we called our lawyers. And they called Mattel and said, hey, this is kind of cool, but you don't have permission exactly. And rather than money changing hands, what we did with Mattel is work with them to make sure that we, we were able to refine the, the type a little bit, get our tagline on there, get the right logo on there. And we made it better um, rather than suing them, which I think is a positive outcome. They call it a city bus, but it is, in fact, uh, Los Angeles. Um, so when you look around and, you, and you're able to, to sort of choose, chew on, sort of take on something really big like this, this was the big splash that we did almost immediately at Metro. We hadn't changed our logo. We hadn't really launched our voice. We hadn't started the groovy photography and then this and that yet. But we look, took a look around and we saw this was possible. Ten years later, uh, another friend called me and said, wow, that TV commercial that I just saw for you guys is incredible. The buses look amazing. And I said, we haven't done any TV commercials with buses. And he said, no, 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 this is for sure Metro. You guys, this is definitely you. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. But I did a little research. He said, well, there was something about natural gas in there, too. I did a little research and found this. not a Metro commercial. <laughs> There's no way if I had seen that script and been asked to comment on it beforehand that I could ever have asked for anything that incredible. I mean, really. And that's, that to me is the, that, that's like the fulfillment in one certain way, if you happen to see that commercial, of what we are really after, which is that we want public transportation and particularly Metro to be part of the fabric of Los Angeles and you know to see that those incredibly well shot pictures of our buses that we only imagined 10 years ago in a commercial that ran nationwide and you know puts LA on a pedestal of of clean and you know changing what's happening in our in our in our region it, it, it's kind of a dream come true. I just couldn't believe it when I saw it. And then, of course, I posted it all over the place and made sure that everybody knew what was happening. Um, so if you think big and you really go for something that you, you can see will have the greatest effect within your own organization or your own company or your client, you know, talk them into it. Because what happens later is that others may actually co-opt your brand in a positive way. Now, I recognize that Metro is sort of in a public realm, but you could be working in the public realm. I, I think you should be working in the public realm, you know, if, if, I could, if I can say that as well. So that's an example of something that started very, uh, on a very sort of, you know, strategic, can we do this scale and sort of blew up and, you know, now we, we have these buses. Every time we buy new buses, they get painted this way. Um, we consider the entire fleet. We have redesigned our rail fleet. You're going to see a new design coming in on your Expo line cars in about a year or two. Uh, it just keeps rolling because you get, you open that door and you keep going. 
Um, you know, the next thing that we really needed to do was sort of think about how to reintroduce ourselves and, and what kind of a, a, a position we wanted to give Metro when we were, are talking to our many audiences. And you've got to find your voice or the voice for your organization. It's really, really important. And I think designers are the number one proponents, creators, and uh, sort of water carriers for the voice of an organization. You, what you do is the voice. It's what people experience for, your, for the brand or for your project. And everything has a voice. It's either the voice you create or somebody else gives voice to it. And when they give voice to it, it's usually not as positive. You know? um, we were faced with a situation where the public approval ratings for Metro were very low. The people responding to a question about do you trust Metro to spend dollars wisely, you know, 85% said no. Um, it's really hard to work in that environment um, as an agency and move forward with, with the big picture because you don't have public trust. And so we really felt like we had to introduce ourselves. The first piece that I ever worked on, I'd say my third week there, was this one. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Look at the logo down there. That's our old logo. It's missing two letters. I don't know what happened there. It says MET. And this, this is not an ins inconsequential piece. If you're driving you know, 200 bus lines a day, 2,000 buses, you need people to drive those buses. And they have to clear a number of hurdles. They can't be a criminal. They have to have a high school degree. They have to be able to drive. They have to have the proper driver's license. But then they have to pass tests and you know, have some sense of service and such. And so the client came in and rang the bell. I think they snuck in before we'd blew, blown up the bell and said, so uh, we need to re reprint this brochure because now instead of $18.41, it's going to be $18.73 an hour. And so everything's fine. I just want a new picture of, a, I want an Asian male operator in front of a bus and we just need to have that type fix. And so I thought, well, okay, but maybe this could get better. And I talked to my brand new boss and said, hey, it feels like this could be more engaging. Maybe this is a chance for us to sort of launch something. Could we have a crack at it? And he said, sure, but we've got some paid media. We're going to do some outdoor. We're going to do some bus benches and king ads, ads on the sides of our buses. So you have three days. Uh, we hadn't even gotten into the branding situation yet. He said, you have three days because we have ad deadlines. So I just sort of sat down, <laughs> torched. I, well, let's do that again. It's so fun. Look at that. And this was the first ad that I wrote, $18 an hour and all the good mornings you can stand. <laughs> Drive a metro bus. And we just kept going. That <laughs> speaks for itself, I think. Old logo, no art, just color, and just this sort of attitude. And that begot the next campaign, uh, which was about being a good citizen in LA. We had a graffiti problem, we always do. We have people etching our seats and etching our buses and etching our stations. You know, I, I, I have said many times, we would have the most beautiful system in the world if nobody wrote it, you know, but that's not what public transportation is about. So um, we wanted to sort of position ourselves and remind people about valuing the system, but also the place they live. So that became Clean Up LA. Again, old logo, really simple uh, design, but just this kind of, you know, voice that we were putting out there and sort of was wanting to see what happened. Um, you know, and at first it was just about that kind of attitude. And so we did that and we had a number of iterations. We had it on trash cans at the beach and we had it on bus benches and billboards, that sort of thing. And, you know, I don't, it was too soon to tell whether anybody was taking notice, but it was fun to do. It's fun to write that stuff and start to think about how that could become the way we talk. Then we got into the nitty gritty of the stuff you guys study in school. Yes, we went to two typefaces. Yes, we went to a color palette and did the letterheads and, you know, um, renamed some of the service and all that stuff. You can't, you have to do that. That's about systemizing. And we do something like 2,500 jobs a year. And so you've got to have a system, and you all are trained in that, and, and you will find that to be very valuable. But um, to me, this was sort of like the necessary work, and we did that so that we could, you know, literally reintroduce ourselves to LA as the new Metro, you know, with a new logo, really simple, a new tagline, Go Metro, and we just kept going from there. This is my personal favorite of all time. We used to be called MTA, right? 
what kind of a name for a public service has the word authority in it? I mean, it, it's just not right. I love this billboard because we had probably a dozen calls to our customer center saying, hey, you guys need to get your money back. There's been a really bad mistake here. Have you seen that billboard and what happened to it? So, you know, that was, oh, people are seeing this. They're actually reacting to this. And, you know, once you thrill from having a dialogue and, um, you know, you're getting a little bit of response to it. We redesigned our fare system and our and our passes, um, and these actually have ended up in the, as Haven said, in the um, National Design Archives in Denver. Um, sadly, we don't make these passes anymore. You all use tap cards now. There's good to that, but I miss I miss this kind of thing because it's it's not about paper anymore. We redesigned all the timetables and made them. Uh, you know, typographically efficient, and we, you know, clear maps and color coding and all that kind of stuff. We tackled maps. We do all of our own cartography and map work. This was the first ad we shot, um, and my good, 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 good friend David Zeitz snuck in. Raise your hand, David. Come on, there he is. He shot this ad, and many, many more. And. To think that we got away with this, when I think about it now, for a very staid public transportation agency to, first of all, custom design a costume, find a security guard at Metro to wear it, um, <laughs> put it on in a setting on a train, and say, you know, this is who commutes on Metro. Everybody does. It's quite astounding to me because, believe me, at that time and even still, there, nobody's doing things like this. And public agencies have a tendency to say, what's the best practice with other public agencies? What are they doing? Let's look at what New York's doing and, and Pittsburgh and Boston. And nobody was, I don't know, crazy enough to do this. But you know, we just kept going. What does it feel like to be stuck in traffic? You know, Here's another David shot. Um, Sure, people have to drive, but what what can you feel like in a carpool? What's life like when you're moving faster? You know, um, and you know, and then we we've, we've used iconography. We we use we we try to co-opt language that people understand and phrasing that people understand and give it a little bit of a twist. So, you know, there's this kind of thing. And then um, I mentioned that dialogue. You know, this was a this was a test we did um, for for um, uh, QR codes, which we use quite a bit now, uh, and we love them because they're so easily programmable, but you know, just this idea about talking to people as they're standing around waiting for their train. Uh, I also love this one because it's so LA, you know. Yes, we are obligated legally to let people know they're being filmed, and that's an important security measure, but at the same time, um, you can have a little bit of fun with it and instill it with the personality that I think, I, I hope, has now become part of our brand. Um, there are always weird projects and weird things that happen, and this, this, you know, voice can happen this way, it can happen in what you experience online, it can happen in your phone, and it can happen on a TV screen. Um, a colleague that I worked with for 10 years, Matt Raymond, who was my boss and, and a great, great collaborator, came to me and he said, so it's May. Our budget year ends in June. You all know about, well, you don't know about, you're too young for that yet, but anybody who works in the system knows you are got to spend all your money before the end of a year because you're going to lose it otherwise and you won't get it back next year. So he said, so we have a small amount of money. Uh, we've been approached by a, an actor and a producer in Hollywood who are trying to get a screenplay sold at Paramount. And we, we need to do a series of spots with them. And oh, by the way, the actor is a guy named Terry Crews. He is six foot four and like 300 pounds of muscle. And he loves to dance. And there needs to be dancing in this spot because the screenplay they're trying to sell is about the world's greatest dancer who started out as an orphan washing cars or washing windows at the side of the freeway and now he's become the world's greatest dancer. So go ahead, work that up and let's make that work. It had nothing to do with anything we were doing. And we went through lots and lots of iterations and met Terry Crews and you know, kept thinking of things and they didn't want to do what we thought of and we didn't want to do what they thought of and blah, blah, blah. Here's what we did ultimately, one of five spots. Traffic every day, sick alert man works backside her. Traffic, money down the drain, bitter baby, stop, go, stop. Vessels in my mind go pop. Metro sweet. From here, to infinity. The answer? Metro. 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 <laughs> <laughs> 
how weird is that? I mean, really, it's weird. And there were five of those, beat poetry, that woman played six instruments and she played a different one in each one. Uh, Matt never actually showed that to our CEO, we just put it on the air. <laughs> and now you know why. Um, but, you know, don't get caught in strict guidelines. Don't, don't, don't make yourself follow your own brand standards. That's for other people who you think will mess with your brand. But the nice thing about having it all reside on that 19th floor behind two fire doors is that we can break our own rules and do something whack like that. And to me, that's as much the Metro voice as a sign, you know, an ad, the way the buses look and feel. Um, this is something you probably know already from the work you're doing. Iterate, iterate, iterate. You just have to keep churning and churning and churning to get to the right solution. But once you find a solution, if you're building a brand or a product line or um, an idea or a nonprofit or whatever, you just have to keep going. This is a sign that uh, used to exist at all of our metro rail stations. It's basically required by law and it says what you can't do. Um, it's a, we call it the no-no sign. This is what I don't know where this even came from. I guess somebody actually created this, but it just cracks me up. Take a look for a moment at these icons. Um, you know, first of all, the woman rollerblading is like Charlie's Angels sort of a thing. There's this muscle guy on the scooter. But my favorite is, look at the loud, boisterous activity, far right, middle row. That's a guy playing a trumpet. Have you ever, ever seen a trumpet player on a metro? It may be in New York, but it's not happening here yet, although we would like to have more buskers on the system to sort of give you a pleasant, you know, or the, the gum one, bottom left looks like boxcars or something. So we thought, why do we have to, we, we want to create something that's completely unique to LA. We don't have to, we don't have to accept this sign. And this sign, the sheriffs that patrol our stations want this sign every 10 feet, basically, because they want to be able to point to it with anybody and say, you can't do this. Because People will say, I didn't know, I don't see a sign, What's the, I don't get it, why, why can't I? So the sheriffs want it everywhere. And when sheriffs say they want it everywhere, guess what happens? It's everywhere because they're sheriffs, right? They have guns, so um, <laughs> who are we to say no? We blew it up and we created this sign. This was the first time that we, uh, we found a guy in Northern California who I still to this day don't know his real name, we just called him Icon Guy. And he created these custom symbols. And now loud, boisterous activity is what really happens, which is that somebody brings a beatbox onto the system and plays what you don't necessarily want to hear. Um, and so this was our first foray into a vocabulary that iterates and iterates and iterates. The next thing we thought is, OK, so our trains and buses arrive from the manufacturers in Alabama or Romania or wherever. Um, with all these signs on them that come with the bus. But why do we have to accept that? Why can't we make them our own? So why can't we make our own signs you know, for the doors that say watch the gap and don't lean and use our own type and our own icons? Well, that's, that's kind of cool. It's starting to feel a little more like our own baby. Well, what happens if we start drawing these things in color? And we expand, and instead of no, 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 they now become things that we can use, you know, for marketing. And oh, now it's on a suite of brochures, our basic family of brochures about how to ride, bike maps, destination guides, that kind of thing. And ultimately, what if they become something where we use that funny, faceless, no hands, no feet character to uh, instruct our own, um, you know, uh, workforce about how to lift a box, let's say, or they can become icons on a bus. They can become a custom wrapped bus for the silver line. And so iterate, 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 and you start to take something that you own as, as a kind of initial thought, and you expand it to be a positive thought as well as what you can't do, and it becomes another whole part of your brand personality. And ultimately, you take the elements of that first sign and you sell it online for 20 bucks. <laughs> so we kind of liked that. We thought that was not so not so restrictive. Um, I'm going to tell you a story now about the importance of listening and asking another question. Um, this, this story has become literally lore, legend within Metro because it's true. And I still work almost every week with this wonderful woman 
um, and we're actively working on the next iteration of, of her particular project. She called me up maybe six months after I'd been there. My phone rang. I didn't know most people at that point. We were still behind those doors doing a lot of work. And I answered the phone. She said, I hear you're the new graphics guy. Don't, don't let anybody call you a graphics guy, first of all, or graphics anything. It's design or graphic design. I said, uh, yeah, so what a way to start out. Yes, and who are you? And she said, my name is Heather, and I'm working on this document. Would you have a couple minutes? Um, I'm on 23, and maybe you could um, come up, and I want to I ask you a question. So I said, sure. I went upstairs and sat down with her in her cubicle, and she pulled out this, which is um, the... Metro's, by the way, how would you know it's Metro? First of all, where's the logo, you know, if you're branding? Uh, this is the long range, long range transportation plan for LA County. This is the most important document we produce. Um, it's, not, it's so important that we can't even produce it every year. It comes out about every five years. And what this is, is, is a, first of all, it's a doorstop, or it was. But it is the document that says, over the next 25 years, here's where we're going to spend all of our money. Here's what we're going to build. Here's the sound walls we're going to do. Here's the new rail line, uh, here's why, here are the pie charts on how this will decrease, you know, or increase traffic speeds by two miles an hour throughout the county, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's required by law. It is read by every politician. It contains all of their pork, if you will, where they're going to, where they're going to get money for their programs in their own, in their own districts. It is the most hot potato political document. But it's also the visions. It's like an annual report and a vision statement. And it's very important because it also lays down the marker of what we say we're going to do, and then we have to do it. So she explained this to me. She said, here's my question. She didn't really explain what it was. She said, this is the document. Oh, by the way, I'm not asking you about design because we already have an outside design firm that's, that did this one. And they're just going to do the update for us. And that's all set. But here's my question. Last time, we did three columns of type. But I was wondering whether you think this year we should do two columns of type instead. <laughs> Graphics guy, what do you think? <laughs> and I took a pause because I really, I had to kind of process that for a minute. I said, well, before I answer that question, let's talk about the document. What is this? Tell me what we're talking about here. And then we spent the next 45 minutes talking about this document and everything that I just told you, I learned in this 45 minutes. And at the end of that, almost hour, I said, Heather, how about this? We're new in town. We're, we're trying to make a name for ourselves. We're trying to win clients who would rather pay consultants, you know, and be in charge themselves. What if we take a crack at this? And, and there's, a, there's a story here that needs to be told, but I don't necessarily see it in here. This feels like a very technical thing that people aren't going to necessarily get engrossed in. What if we take a crack at it? And she said, oh, I don't know, a really strict timeline, and you know, uh, this has to, the board has to approve it in six months, and blah, blah, blah. I said, we'll be fast. We'll give you a couple of options. We'll, we'll ask you to come down, and we'll do a presentation to you. And, and if you like it, then we could, we could take over the update of the, of the Long Range Transportation Plan. If you don't, your PO is in place, and the money's been put in, and you can use your firm. And this is what it became. First person, from the point of view of our customers, beautiful photography, a story. What do you want? I want a better commute. I want a better quality of life. You know, very simple layout, the first seven spreads were the kind of thing you flip through. You know, all the technical stuff was still back there. We had to do charts and graphs and that sort of thing. But, you know, what a difference. And why can't we say we're creating a better world? We are creating a better world. Let's own it, you know. Um, and we went through three rounds of presentations. She kept bringing back more people from her team. And ultimately, the head of planning came in. And then he went off to work as a consultant. And so two weeks later, there was another head of planning who came in and looked at all this on the wall. And we ultimately printed you know, twice as many as they had printed the first uh, iteration that you saw. And that first iteration, they printed, I think, about uh, 5,000. And at the time that Heather and I were talking, which was five years into that particular document's life, 4,000 of them remained in boxes in the basement of Metro. We printed 10,000, and they sold out, if you will. And 18,000 people viewed it online, which doesn't mean that it's the most revolutionary design in the world. It certainly isn't. What it means is when you tell a story 
and you, you relate to people and you tell the important story Metro has to tell, but you do it in a way that people would want to read, more people are going to read it. And that means we reach more citizens with a very important message. Um, along those same lines, ask questions. Our head of government relations came down. He loves the studio. He likes to just hang out. And he has the job of going to Washington and asking for money along with every other city in the country, every other transportation agency, not to mention every other kind of everything, goes to Washington to ask for federal money. And he said, we need to tell a better story. And my ears perked up. I said, oh, tell me what the story is. He said, well, here's the document. Here's the, here's the Excel spreadsheet. This is all the money awarded by the federal government to different transit agencies all over the country to build new things. And somewhere in there is a line about Los Angeles. And what this says is, here's your population. Here's what you were awarded. And Metro ranked almost last. Regardless of the size of the city, regardless of the ask, we were not getting our fair share. We are 10 million people in LA County. We're one of the most populous regions in the country. If you want to buy an iPod in Iowa, it comes off a ship at the busiest port system in the world, practically, which is in LA, and travels across the country. So we are an economic engine. We spur growth. We move goods. And we're not getting our fair share of federal dollars. So uh, I said, OK, well, let's see if we can visualize this in a different way. And I took this chart, and I gave it to a really amazing intern at the time um, who graduated from another art institution, but it could have been one of you, or it could be. And I said, here's the, here's the story. Here's the data. How could we look at this a different way? And this is what she came up with. Um, the green is the uh, amount of money that different centers across the country were given by the federal government in that year. The yellow, is the, the yellow dot is the population size. Look over there to the left. You know where LA is. Big circle represents the amount of people that there are in LA versus other parts of the country. You see that little tiny dot? We got $9.5 million for 12 million people. Uh, let's take Salt Lake. I love that one. 1 1.1 million people. They got $180 million. So all of a sudden, right there you can see, oh my god, LA is huge, and yet we're getting practically nothing. And this map got iterated over two or three years' time because it was so effective at very quickly telegraphing what the situation was. And it actually became something that alarmed people in Washington, because you can't ignore Los Angeles and not give them what they need, or you're going to have a real economic problem on your hands. And when former Ver Mayor uh, Villaraigosa had two minutes on the tarmac with President Obama, I scheduled two minutes with President Obama about three years ago outside of Air Force One, he handed him one piece of paper. And that's it. So, and that's a true story because I verified it four times over the years. With, I said, Rafi, really? One piece of paper? That was it? That's what he handed to Obama. So what does design do? That's what it does. It can be one piece of paper. It's not even viewed on an iPad. It's one piece of paper, and that's the kind of thing that it can do. Guess what? We are leading the country now in New Starts funding. We are a model for the rest of the country in what we're doing, and all that isn't because of this map, but I can tell you with confidence this had something to do with it. Um, so I think one of the things that we had to learn really quickly is that nobody cares until you make them care or you get their attention. I am really big into brevity. It's respectful of your audience to not assume that they're going to take all the time in the world to read something complex or to look at perhaps overly designed type when you're really trying to pass information to them. But you can be smart about it. You can be wily about it. Um, this is a campaign that we did a couple of years ago that um, turned out to have some really great legs and to be quite different for us. The idea was, we need to be the solution. Um, but what's the problem? We can't knock drivers for driving alone. That's too personal. It doesn't feel good to say you're an idiot because you are driving by yourself. But you can knock the idea of gas being too expensive or, as you'll see, a couple other things. The idea was that Metro needed to be painted as the solution. And so Matt and I were sitting in a room and he said, the problem is this, and we want Metro to be the solution. And I said, hey, problem, solution. That's opposites. That's really easy to understand. And so we started playing, and we just kept iterating, and this became the campaign. 
in a way, it's wholly unoriginal, right? It's two words. Everybody has that symbol in their car, right? But that's the point. We all recognize that. It's part of our life. It's part of life in a car when you're sitting by yourself. What if you see it in a different way? Ooh, wow, empty again, man. Or, you know, not one of you, less of you in your car alone, more of us. And of course, never underestimate the value of a t-shirt, right? Um, so we did this whole opposites thing. We kept going. It's the first time we ever used black as a field color. It's the first time we ever separated the M in a circle from the word metro. You know, we thought we're never going to get approval for this. It's too stark. It's too minimal. It, it probably remains the most recognized and, you know, quoted sort of campaign we've done because it's so brief. It's so easy to understand. It works anywhere. There were no production problems, you know. No beautiful David Zeitz photographs to hope that the color came out well. It's just this, you know. Um, and by the way, we then sent t-shirts to uh, the winning baristas, the best baristas in LA, which were at um, Intelligentsia in Silver Lake. And we sent them a whole batch of them. And one day my boss walked in, and they were all wearing them. So now you're part of the fabric, pardon the pun, because it's a t-shirt, literally, of Los Angeles. And another sort of dream come true. Um, in the same way, we, we, we have tried to continue that sort of respect and brevity. Here's the new campaign that David and I shot last year. So simple, two words, you know. But rather than show a freeway or the idea of, you know, lanes that way, what about this, you know? How can we show the idea of savings in a different way? Because that's what happens when you ride Metro, but it doesn't have to be you on a bus. Um, you know, the idea of our mobile apps and the fact that they help you to literally fly through traffic. Um, you know, why wash your car when you can wash a great huge piggy bank because you're saving so much money. Um, and, you know, we have a variety of messages we need to get out there. One of them is the fact that we're a job creator. So Metro is about more jobs. You know, it was a struggle at first to come up with this idea because two words is a lot harder than 10, you know? And one of them is the same word every time. Oh, and by the way, I painted myself into a real corner because that second word has to fit into a dot, a round form. It can't be long. And, you know, I have to wrestle with David and say, yeah, well, part of the, there's going to be great big dots, you know, that go over the photograph and that sort of thing. But um, I, I really love this campaign because it's a different way of looking at a complicated idea, which is that we're a job creator. And that in itself is not very sexy, but when you when you think of it this way and you, and you get a fake pigeon to sit next to you, you know, it becomes a little more interesting, I think. Um, the other thing that we did, and I would really suggest this for you, this is something that, that, that David thought of and helped with, but um, when you're doing this kind of work and you're doing it for, um, as an in-house group, there's always a need for survival, you know. Um, there are always people who want to go back to that agency that they can control and they have a budget and that sort of thing. So we wanted to be able to kind of internally toot our horn, but we also wanted to share a little bit about the fun and excitement of the creative process. So um, I said to David, maybe you could, you know, you're always taking little videos and, and shots of us taking the shots and that sort of thing, you know, for your own kind of chronicling. What if we turn that into uh, something which David said, oh yeah, it's a behind the scenes movie. And he made one for us and this is it.
that idea serves about three masters. First of all, it opens up the kimono in a way and lets people into our creative process. Um, secondly, it's, it helps us get more people interested in being models. We only use uh, Metro employees as our models, which saves a ton of money, but it also builds camaraderie within the agency. And we now have to literally sort of swat them away because everybody wants to be in a Metro you know, spot. Um, and it also, reinf you know, people, when you do really good work or good work or pretty good work, um, people tend to think there's a button on your computer that's like, go and boom, it just springs out, done. And obviously it doesn't, a great, a great deal of energy and resource goes into it. And we wanted to be able to help our own agency and even people out in the, in the world understand um, how that works. So um, this became a story that ran on our own blog, the source, and was seen both internally and externally. And it really helped us to kind of establish you know, what we do creatively for the umpteenth time, but also um, when I'm really had a bad day, I just go home and I just play this over and over again and remind myself that there'll be another photo shoot coming up, you know, one day for me and David. Um, so, uh, design can be beautiful, but if it's not doing anything, it's not doing anything. And uh, I worked for a number of years with a really very, very smart woman named Kim Bear, and her favorite phrase was, where, do, where does pretty get you? Um, it's not just about the skin. It's not just about the color and composition. What does this piece of design do? What is it meant for? Um, I want to. I want to kind of give you the um, the atmosphere that we were in not too long ago, which was that we had we had corrected ourselves in terms of public opinion and faith and how we were spending money and and what our what our programs and, and construction priorities were going to be. But we were operating within California, which is still basically broke. And the governor then, or governator, as, as I called him at the time, he, he kept taking money from transportation budgets, like gas tax money and other monies, to balance the budget or to try to you know sort of stem the bleeding, which is what politicians do. But that meant that we were literally not able to put shovels in the ground. And we were sending you know, people who thought they were going to have construction jobs for the next 10 years didn't, because we didn't have the money for it. So we decided we need to kind of test this brand and see what we can do. Um, you test yourself. You make sure that you are finding ways to, to test your effectiveness. Here's a, here's a couple of things we learned. When people see our ads, the favorable rating, which is important because it's about your faith as a customer in, in your brand, uh, climbs from 43 to 61%. For public transportation, that's quite a jump. When they see our ads, the chance they're going to try the service jumps 24%. That's huge. Um, in 18 months of running uh, the first or second Go Metro campaign, discretionary ridership, meaning people who have a choice in a car and choose to go Metro instead, increased 8%. The national average increase at that, during that 18-month period was 4%. And we're in Los Angeles, which is the toughest transit market in the country, because we are 1,300 square miles spread out. It's not New York where you can walk two blocks and know there's a subway station. It's never going to be that, by the way, just so you know. I wouldn't want you to get your hopes up too much, but our system is growing. So how can we test this in a really significant way and um, really go for what, what I have called our Everest? And the Everest for us was to be in control of our funding, to have a seemingly unending source of revenue that would come in to Metro as the bank and the planner and the builder of, of you know, countywide transportation. Um, and so we, we went for the ultimate roll of the dice, which was that we created a ballot measure in 2008 called Measure R. We, because we're a quasi-governmental agency, we don't have to gather 500,000 signatures. Um, but we were able to place this ballot uh, using taxpayer dollars, I might add, you know, to pay the registrar. But we got this on the ballot. And we basically said, would you pay another half cent in sales tax every time you buy anything, a shirt, groceries, you know, um, any good that you pay sales tax for in LA County, if that money is coming only to Mount County? The high, the, 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 and so we created Measure R. We also insisted that we do the public information materials. These pieces, and here's an inside piece, very simple. 
goals, what the, what the facts are. Here's the map showing the projects that this will fund over 30 years. There's highway projects, there's transit projects. Every single word in this document, which went out to 7 million registered voters, um, was vetted by probably four lawyers. I mean, they, they looked at this cover and said, why is that traffic going so fast? Are you promising that much speed? You know, um, is, does that caution sign really exist? Now, is that really the way the map's going to, are we going to do it? You know, endless questions because we could not use the word vote. We could not persuade. It had to be vetted public information, but we really insisted on presenting that ourselves, which was really important. And you may recall, 2008 was a pretty significant election. Our current president was running for the first time. There was extremely high new voter engagement for young people. Um, and people who had not voted ever or who were re-engaged in the political process were voting. It was very high turnout. We knew it was then or not, basically. Because if you need to get two-thirds of voters approving of this measure, which is 66 point something percent, you better go for the most voters you can, rather than say a midterm election like uh, the one coming up in 2014 where the voting patterns are different. So we did polling and we did a lot of research and we put together these very scrubbed materials and then people went to the polls. And here's the actual county registrar's um, report from 2008 in case you missed it. Yes, 67.93%. We had to get 66.6%. We squeaked by, if you missed it, let me just emphasize that for you. Uh, it's such a high bar to get that two thirds that in fact this year, probably in the California legislature, in, in uh, legislation will be introduced, sponsored by Metro, to say, why two thirds? How about 50% like most other majority rule situations in a democratic society? Because it's really hard to get that many voters. We did it once, by the way, we went back to the ballot in 2012 to extend the sales tax and we were defeated. Guess what we didn't do? We didn't mail information to 7 million voters. And people didn't understand what we were asking, and they didn't know whether this was a new tax or um, an extension. They weren't even positive it was for Metro because somehow MTA got on there again, and we don't even refer to ourselves that way anymore. So you've got to stand up and provide the information. We know that. Um, but. Things were rosy in 2008 on November 4th or 5th, and what does that really mean? What it means is $40 billion in funding over the next 30 years specifically for um, Metro to program specifically for new projects, and we're going to build four new rail lines, and that's why you have the Expo line opening. That's why you have the Expo line going to Santa Monica. We're going to build the Crenshaw line. We're going to extend the subway out to, San out to uh, Westwood, and highway projects in the 405. Have you ever been caught in that nightmare? It's a nightmare now. It's going to be better, and we are really building and building and building. This presents now an entirely new um, situation for us. How do we communicate with these people? How do we keep the voter faith? How do we let people know that we're going to make a whole bunch of messes, but it's going to be worth it? And these are all projects that don't exist. So we went to a really talented um, uh, illustrator named uh, Paul Rogers, who is an art center professor as well. And we said, we need to start building a library of images that will represent the future. And we, we really wanted it to feel like something that kind of harkened back to WPA in the 30s and that kind of, you know, um, can do, you know, roll up your sleeves construction feeling. And now we're applying this library, just as we do with a library of photography, to endless pieces of material and situations. You know, come to a community meeting to learn about the Crenshaw Corridor. Um, we're building the Foothill Extension in your neighborhood. This is on the 210 freeway, right where you're gonna, where that extension is gonna go, and let you, you know, keep going on the train rather than having to get off um, and, and 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 face the freeway again. Um, we have to do reports on where this money is going. Uh, you know, we talk to our employees and inspire them with the fact that the reason you have a job now and we're hiring is because we got this passed, and this is your future in the works. There, you know, we talk to our customers and say, you love riding the train, there's more rail coming. You know, we use parking lot sides to talk about uh, some big picture ideas. We use our own Union Station, the other side of Union Station, to, to sort of drum this thing up. And we also 
love technology and recognize that you know not everybody's going to see this passing through one of our portals but you know what if we can use QR codes and you can scan something from a printed material and get all the contact information and then you know be able to to press a button and email press a button and find a community meeting press a button and call to ask about it you know so this idea of you know taking a look at your future in this in this comp what we're saying is scan the QR code and you can see what the new union station looks like with a high speed rail portal and bus located in a different place and a hotel and retail all of these things may in fact come to pass so that's about testing your brand that's about putting your faith in what you've been doing um, and really going for something big and then once you go for something big if you win you've got something even bigger you know you've got job security for a good long time if you're if you're us you know um, so um, Something else quite wonderful happened to me personally in this job, which was that I realized that I love where I live. Um, I've been married for 22 years. My wife and I are both from Los Angeles. We grew up here. We've traveled. We've been, we've been to Paris, I'll have you know, and a lot of other cities. And we've, every time we go someplace, we used to think, we want to live here. We're going to go to Atlanta and work for the Olympics. We want to live in Boston. My God, it's an incredible day in Portland today. Let's go look at real estate. We were travel lust. We wanted to live someplace else, and we never moved. And then we had kids, and then they started school. And, we, and for a while, I sort of thought, gosh, why didn't we ever try something else? And it took this job and becoming part of something really big and uh, being at the center of this nexus of money and politics and change and coercion and you know solving a really big problem that I have, had grown up to see sort of overtake Los Angeles to realize that, oh, the reason I didn't move is because I love it here. And now I have a job where I can be a kind of a civic booster. And one of the things we think is really important about our work and what we do at Metro is to remind people how great LA is. You know, and a transportation agency doesn't necessarily have that in their, you know, um, brief, if you will. But we think it's important. And so, you know, what does it feel like to go to a classic corner like Hollywood and Vine? But oh, instead of in your car, you're seeing out the bus window. You know, and you can go Metro to go out. Um, you know, presenting the idea of taking a bus and one day, David, yes, it's true, a train to LAX. You know, to this to this groovy. Uh, airport to get out of town. We do this series of what we call neighborhood art posters. These are all created by um, by fine artists, some of whom are getting something published for the first time. And we do posters. They suggest where they want to, um, you know, what city they want to represent. They can choose their medium. It's either, uh, you know, illustration or etchings or uh, more of a sort of graphic design approach or beautiful photography. We've done 40 of these over the last eight years. And they really are about A, you can go metro to this place, but B, we recognize that there isn't one LA. There are eight dozen LAs, and it's all about that. Um, this is an old train depot in the valley. This is right where the red line terminates at North Hollywood, and then you walk across the street now, and you get on the orange line, which is that, that, that fantastic bus that feels like a train that you saw earlier with the lavender growing along the path. But this is this uh, historic depot from the 20s that literally looked like this for years and years and years, you know, sort of falling apart, and yet it was now metro property. And it's currently about to start getting reconstructed eight years later. But during that time, we said, wait, there's construction fencing. It just looks really sad. And it's, it's right next to our brand new stations. Isn't there something we can do? So we created this um, long, 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 one of, the, one of the longest piece of bannering uh, that we have done, um, which was uh, basically covering up a little bit of the blight until we really got started fixing it. But also, it became this really wonderful typographic build um, that was specific to that area. These are all streets in the valley, and there's some mapping behind there, and there's some, and then there's factoids all along here about how Chatsworth Boulevard was named and what kind of agriculture used to happen in the valley before it became the land of, you know, 7-Elevens and whatever else. Um, so this thing runs on all four sides. And what you get are people walking along to go to our state from station to station or just out in the world, uh, you know, sort of learning something. Um, we, we do this series of Go Metros where we literally show you where on the map and whatever, you know, and of course the observatory is, a, is a sort of an obvious one. Well, what about the flower district? You know, you can, you can go Metro to, to buy flowers or to play pool 
in Pasadena. So I love these projects particularly because, yes, they're about a bus or a train in one sense, but they're really about LA. We, every year, um, one of our Metro buses is in the uh, West Hollywood Gay Pride Parade, and we do the banner. These are Metro employees marching, and we do this banner every year, and this was one of my favorites. It's all the different colors of our rail lines just presented in a kind of a different way, uh, and, you know, obviously, the message is knocked out of that. Um, uh, sorry, I had to go back because I don't want to start yet. Um, this idea that I showed you earlier where if you become sort of a quantity that's known to people and they start to celebrate you a little bit, um, that can be scary because you can be characterized, you, sort of, you, can, you can think of it as losing control of your brand in a way, or you can have faith in what you're doing and let it go. Um, and a couple years ago, we concocted this idea, which I, 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 I've referred to in meetings for a little while as we were sort of thinking of it, vetting it, and thinking about all the bad things that could happen as well as the good. I, I, I approached it as, okay, let's turn over the keys. Let's let other people talk or, or create uh, ideas about why they love Metro. And so we sponsored the first ever video flicks contest. It's a terrible name, and I, I'm happily not claiming credit for that. But the idea was, Hey, LA, this is LA. Uh, make a one minute movie about why you take Metro, why you love Metro. That first year, we had something like 80 entries. Um, we, we put no restrictions on them. They didn't have to use a logo. They could make it, it just had to be a minute, and it had to have something to do with why they take or enjoy Metro as a service. Um, we got all these entries, and we picked, we went through them and picked the top 10, and then we let uh, our web. Uh, audience vote, and I'm going to show you um, the winner from that first year. I think we're on our third year this year, but I think you'll see that, again, there's no way I could have thought of something quite this good, I think, or that, the, or that we could have developed something quite this good, um, and it's just so satisfying to have someone else create it. Oh, sorry. Let's try that again. First of all, could you just die? Because how cute is that? <laughs> uh, Faye Kingsley is her name. And she, they weren't all quite this polished, I'm, I will readily admit. But she had no leg up on anybody else. She wrote this script. She cast it. I don't know how they managed to pull that off, because we didn't help them with filming. We didn't offer help to anybody. The dirty windows of the train and all are right there. But that's our train. That's, you know. Those were the ads that were up. Um, we hired Fit Kingsley after that um, to be on our bench of video people. And about 
a year ago, uh, we were we had an idea for uh, something that we had to do where we wanted to go to her, her and her partners on that, and she suddenly wasn't with the company anymore. And this is where the LA story completely rounds out. Um, we sort of thought, well, what happened to Faye? We, you know, we, we, we hadn't even gotten to do a project with her yet, but we really were interested in her creativity because of, of this, and so we sort of put her on on call, and when we went to get her, she wasn't available, and about two weeks ago, I saw, I was uh, out in the bus plaza, I saw King Ed go by, and there is Faye Kingsley on a brand new series that's gonna be on, like, Lifetime or whatever. She got cast, you know, so, <laughs> there goes Faye, but, you know, she made this movie, and she's now on uh, TV, and on her way. So, granted, that doesn't happen to everybody, and that's not the point. The point is that Metro, uh, you know, that's sort of the the fantasy of how why you'd ride the train is like to fall in love and meet, you know, your dream. Um, and granted, that's not the reality. But our job is not necessarily to show the reality of that person that might be really heavy and and smelly. And the reality is, you know, the reality is there. What we're about is the possibility and the idea of turning this over to people to do their own. Uh, you know, their own creative thinking really appeals to us. It's fraught with a little bit of danger because you're not in control, but if you have faith and you've done your sort of, you know, um, architectural design structuring, um, you know, you can be that brave. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, a word, I love that one. Let's watch that again. That's so bad. It's so bad, it's good. Um, a word about fun. Um, your, your first job is not going to be your last job. Your first job is not going to be as good as you think it's going to be, probably. Uh, your first job, you're going to be doing work that you may feel is so much less interesting than what you do in design school. And you're going to be at the bottom of the totem pole. That doesn't mean that you can't find ways to have fun. So my word about fun is have it. You saw our space. It's behind fire doors. We're in cubes. We can't even pick a wall color. So we just put stuff up on the wall instead. But you know, we can do things like this, you know, and, and, and have that, uh, you know, be part of the Metro vocabulary. If your new CEO says that all men are supposed to wear ties at work, like a dress code out of 1952, um, okay, why don't we design a tie? You know, and now bus operators wear this tie, and I have one as well when I have to put it on, um, you know. Um, Every year for about four years running, the design studio, a staff of four or five or eight or ten, would run up and down our building there to the left, turn on lights, turn off lights, close doors, open windows, and create a 12-story heart on February 14th. Um, nobody asked us to do it. We didn't ask anybody if we could do it. We used our own cell phones and walkie-talkies, and you know we had people down on every side of the building, down on the street. And I would say, no, no, on, on 18, I'd count up and count over and say, you got to close that window and turn off the lights. It was fun. It was our own gift to LA because we love LA. By the way, our building is visible from four freeways. So that's not bad, right? We don't have our logo at the top of our building. We tried, we designed it, we priced it, and then um, the sheriff said, oh no, that's a security risk. We don't want people to know where Metro is. Well, I do want people to know where Metro is, and so this is our solution for that. And then we made Tom's shoes for an AIGA contest, and the lights really work, and you know, and that sort of a thing. Um, this was all really mostly Great people on my crew, you know, of every age and stripe wanting to do these things. Sometimes you have to sort of live what you preach and be willing to have fun when you least expect it. David and I were cooking up an idea for an ad a couple years ago, and it involved a particular character. And the character was going to have to really emote and, and be able to, you know, be very... Um, photographic and, and, and do this particular thing. And we, we talking through it and we, we, we worked it all out and we worked out the ad and then I said, great, well now we have to find a really great Metro employee who will do this. And David said, well, it's you, you have to do it. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm not in the ads and I think of the ads with you, but I'm not gonna do this. And he said, no, you really, it has to be you. We're doing three different setups in this day and we can't run the risk of having somebody come out there and not know what to do. I need you to do what you just did for five minutes in this meeting, you know. And so I spent an hour in makeup and <laughs> and I said to him, you can't ever tell anybody that's me. And I don't think he actually did, 
but the first time this ad came out, we were in a big staff meeting, and Matt said, hey, you look great as that mime, you know? <laughs> so I could have remained incognito, but you know, you, you, you pony up um, when you need to. And if, you, and if it's time to wear a really bad holiday sweater, you know, we do it. It's fun, but fun has a purpose, and we are the fun at Metro. We're at the fun at an agency where planners can take eight years to see their project come to life, or they work on a project for eight years and then it's killed in a budget process, where the 20th floor is 100 accountants working on, you know, Excel from 2006 or something like that, you know. So there needs to be fun. And we, our doors are, have to stay closed, but they're always open, you know, and we, we make sweaters and we do these kinds of things because it brings life to uh, everybody's, you know, world. And you can be that, be the creative designer that you are trained to be. Um, uh, one last thing, a final thought, um, which you will learn, I think, early on when you rub up against people that are hard for you to deal with, and you will come to cherish this idea, I think, when you uh, start creating relationships that can last for 10 years or longer. Um, but really, regardless of the work that you do, the companies that you work for, the import of it in your own mind or other people's minds, the budgets, the reach, um, the specificity, regardless of any of that, um, the thing that I have found day in and day out that really matters is that people matter most. I, I happen to, I had this idea in my head and I knew it because part of my job is to choose the people that we ask into our family and that we that we seat in a cubicle um, and that we work with every day. And we also have to work with everybody else in this 10,000 person organization. But a paper company put this little booklet together and it was in a, one of those goodie bags at a, at a conference. When I pulled it out, it was kind of an aha moment for me. Like, that's the thing. It's people. It's the people you'll work with, you'll work for, people underneath you, people above you, clients that you think are difficult. They all matter. And if you approach it that way and make the most of those relationships, there's almost no limit to how far you can go and, and, the, and the fun and satisfaction and effectiveness that you can have in your job. So that's my last heart-tugging thought for you. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. And thanks for hanging in for that long. Oh, wait, you need my glasses? Oh, okay, let's all off, all on. That was off. All on. Okay, there we go. Yep. Um, it's, you know, late-ish, but if anybody would like to query or comment, rave or deride, whatever you want to do, I'm here for you. Yes? Uh, have any of your campaigns ever failed at Metro? And how do you deal with that? I'm certain they have. <laughs> I've blocked it out, of course. Um, the, request, the question is, have any of your campaigns at Metro ever failed, and how do you deal with that? Um, we move right on, honestly. Um, there's always something new, and by the time something actually hits the street, or the tube, or whatever, or, or the web page, we're already on to something else. That's a real luxury. If you are at Pentagram, let's say, should any of you get be lucky enough to get a job at Pentagram at any time in your life, um, any Pentagram office, by the way, um, you know, you do far less work. You, it's more about five big things a year, and I, I think you probably feel failures more, even though Pentagram rarely fails. But um, we've certainly done things that haven't worked out. David and I shot an ad. Um, with two people on a bus and they were almost kissing and we did a sort of a fog and a heart and we thought it was kind of cute and it was gonna be something that was gonna come out, this idea that you're out there meeting people. Um, and that ad ran and a board member um, was outraged because uh, about a, two weeks before the ad hit the streets, um, a woman had been raped in one of our parking structures. And this board member said, how can you put this out there about people kissing on a bus when this is you know, the reality? Of course, that's not the reality. The reality is somewhere between people kissing on a bus and people getting attacked in a parking structure, but that one got pulled right away. Um, there have been other things that I just think haven't, haven't resonated 
Um, but we are churning all the time. We put resources into the big stuff, like the, the stuff that David and I work on together, or other kinds of campaigns. Um, but, you know, I, I guarantee you as a designer that when you finally hit the send button and you something goes to print and you're on press, hopefully with David Mays over here at Fantastic, um, print, his own printing company, not his own, but a great one, um, you will be there on press, and while you're trying to, you know, astutely judge the sheet and whether everything is right, you're going to think, oh, I wish I'd done that differently, you know. <laughs> Why did I make it green? Or that type needs to be two points bigger. It's, it's the curse of design. You live with something for so long, you iterate, 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 and then when it's finally done, you're already dissatisfied. So my advice, the cure for that is to get to a company, a space, a practice of your own, uh, an independent studio, an in-house group that is busy, because then you will move right on. Um, and Metro, you know, we work really hard on these things, a lot of money, resources, time, go into it, and they're out for a little while, not ever as long as I want, and then there's something else. And that's the way of the world, you know. So, yeah, you'll fail for sure. You just go on to the next thing. And you try to incorporate, oh, next time, two points bigger, you know, or whatever it is, right? But don't hang on to it, because it's no fun to do that, you know. Yeah. How do you strike a balance between bringing fun into your branding and doing what you're obligated to do? If ever there was a case, a company like that, that's Metro. Every single thing that we produce of any visual kind, including all that type on the bus, you know, we don't just put nation's largest clean air fleet up there because we like italic, you know, Scala Sands. That's a piece of information. That's a point of pride. We are the nation's greenest fleet. Um, and it belongs there. Um, but everything we do is a piece of information. And that's true of salad dressing labels or, you know, T-shirts or rock posters. But it's particularly true of what we do. And it's information people actually need to make a decision with. So you could see that it would be very dry. And in fact, some of our stuff is a little bit drier. We're working on materials now for the public meetings that we're required to have because we probably have to raise our fares. It's inevitable. We're the, we're the cheapest ride in the country, uh, and we have gone. We are, and we've gone a long time without without raising our fares. Um, but we have to do it. That piece of that take one has no visual on it. There's no fun icon. There's no David Zeitz photography. Come to a public hearing on fare increases because it's bad news, and so you have to know when the fun is appropriate. We're not. That's, that's not a happy situation, but it's a reality. Whereas if you're trying to get people to try something or think of themselves on the bus when they wouldn't or the very idea of public transportation in LA, that's where you bring in the fun. And you look for ways to do that in things that don't even necessarily need it because anything that is more sticky and engaging is going to get a longer read and more of the mind share. So we balance that. But I, I truly believe, I, I remember giving a talk in Boston a couple of years ago, and afterwards some people come up to ask me a question or say thank you, or boy, that really was disappointing or whatever they said. And there was this person who literally looked like they were going to start crying when they finally got to the front of the line to say hello to me. And, and this guy said, you know, it's really great what you do, and you're so lucky, but I work for the Social Security Administration. And I'm the only designer. And my boss has been there for 32 years, and he won't do anything new. And there's no way that I can ever even, you know, this was just a depressing hour for me, basically. <laughs> I sort of took that in, you know, mirrored that a little bit, as one will do. And I didn't want to sort of get in his face, but as I was riding home in the taxi, I thought, God, if ever there's anything that needs a redesign, it's Social Security. Every single citizen of the United States is a client, right? We're all customers. And I've started to get those notices. They're not that easy to understand, you know? If banks put a million dollars into, you know, Landor redesigning their materials, why shouldn't the Social Security Administration? And that's the guy that's going to do it. You, you, you turn that depression into energy, and you just don't quit because you know you're right. It should get better. 
and it reaches every U.S. citizen. So I wish I'd taken his card, because I would still be to this day calling him once a week saying, so how's it going? <laughs> have you made any headway? Is the guy dead yet? You know, have you, are, are you in your redesign? It can happen. I don't mean that that should be fun, but it should be better. Everything can be better. Everything can be better. Yeah. Sure. David, do we literally count the white guys that we have in our ads? Or are there enough women? Or You know, in LA, it's not even as simple as we need an Asian, and a black, and a white. It's like you think that you are, we've cast somebody and we sort of think perhaps they're Asian and they're actually Filipino or they're Pacific Islander. LA is everybody. and. That's what I love about it is we sort of, in a way, we're not as beholden to those kind of, really they're stereotypes of like you need this and this and this and this. What we need is just men and women of different colors. We don't actually know what their heritage is. It's LA. I mean, you know, there are people in this room, I'm sure, who have this kind of a father, this kind of, you know, and that's what makes it fun. We have to watch the white people a little bit because that's an obvious, you know, thing. Um, but. Uh, we do we do have to do that balance. It's really easy at Metro. We have 10,000 employees, and they are an absolute mirror of, you know, I could find a pygmy, you know, Pacific Islander who's had a sex change, and they probably work at Metro, you know, and we can cast them in that. Can we edit that, by the way, and just take that out? But really, there's everybody, and they all want to participate, so it's really fun. And, and you know, um, we just try to get really cool models who are enthusiastic and fit the part, and then what happens is it does look like LA, because it is, you know? But yes, uh, that's about casting. We have, to put, we have to translate things into eight languages, sometimes. Try putting eight different languages on a rail poster, you know? Or you can't drop a word, and we and we don't even typeset that stuff. Like we, you know, we send out, and Tagalog comes back in the InDesign file, you know, and um, Mandarin and Japanese, and what like we typeset the Spanish, and that's all we can do, you know. So we are a public agency. Your money, everything we do is your money, and it has to reflect. And and there's incredible uh, ADA requirements on everything we do, and fairness issues and all of this. It's, it's a very rigorous, unique design challenge. But it's just a challenge like anything else. We can make it look good. We can make it more readable, you know, even in Tagalog. Uh, Which, by the way, is a Pacific Islander language I come to know. Yes, <laughs> or months. Or years, they're all different. I mean, um, we do things in a day. We we have we recently did an accounting for a reason I don't need to go into, but we have a new chief in our in our group who really wanted to come to understand why we do some of the jobs we do. Are we concentrating our energies and our and our and our resources on the big stuff, or is there a lot of little stuff? Because we're real truly full service. We do you know, resolutions for when someone retires and they're going to get recognized at a board meeting. We do a resolution, you know, that, that kind of stuff, as well as ad campaigns and signage and maps. So we did a total of all the jobs we've opened since um, the 1st of January, and it's now basically it's a one month's worth. We opened 250 jobs in that time. A third of them were hot, hot is what we call that. I call it smoking hot sometimes or burning hot or incendiary, but the fact is it gets two stamps on it that are little flames in red, and hot, hot means that it's due in three days or less. A third of the jobs that we opened are due in three days or less. But there are jobs on our job list that have been going on for six months. Those are Klingons. They never go away. There's something wrong. Why is it taking six months? And we have to look at those as well. But um, we try to allot resources, you know, Proportionally, one person works on that resolution and they can basically get it done in 15 minutes. We tell them it took an hour, but we do it in 15 minutes. It's a templated thing. You plug in information. 
No, not at all. No, no. It could be a sign. It could be a poster that's nothing but type. It's just that somebody in the client world, oh, I forgot that ad that I promised six months ago to this, you know, awards dinner, and now it's due tomorrow, you know. And you have to do that because you're full service and those people will complain if you, if you don't service them. But we're working on a new bike campaign now, and that... Um, that's pretty fast in that we've got to have it from concept to um, completed art in about three months time because there's media being purchased and you're going to see it on a billboard in May. We're still, we're in our fourth round of design. Every designer in the studio is working on it because they want to and it's fun and interesting and it's going to be out there and it matters. Um, and we can legitimately put all those people on it, um, you know, in the in the early stages where we're really trying to nail that concept. Ultimately, one person is going to do all that production, but we need as many, you know, darts thrown up at the wall as we can get. So we, everybody works on it at that point. Does that sort of get your question answered? Anybody else? OK. Sure, why not? You know. <laughs> what the hell? So, so was it like a ton of portfolio work over the years from, you know, when you're asking people mm -hmm. They could tell a story. I could go, come back tomorrow and we'll just talk for like two hours about interviewing. Or maybe I'll come back and do a guest lecture. I, I really love that. And I, and I think I actually have a lot of value on this. I've done it at Art Center. I'd love to do it here. I think that, um, and I don't have a design degree. I didn't, I didn't go to school for design. Um, but I, what I see in people coming in right out of school is that their technical skills are superb, generally. They've got the suite of programs, and they're into motion, or they're coding, or they're this, or they're that. Great, we need all of that. But they can't tell a story about why we should hire them. And I'll quickly give you my analogy of this, because you're all going to be in that position. If you are applying for a job at any company, chances are, first of all, they're going to see your work. They're going to see it online, right? You all have websites now or whatever. You're going to send a PDF, whatever it is. They're going to see all that in a disembodied way. When we put out a call for a part-time contract job, no benefits, you know, $40, $30 an hour, we'll get 200 responses. So we've got to get, we're required to look at and synthesize 200 applications. We narrow, and then, then, I don't even know who you are, what you look like, or whether you're Tagalog or that pygmy. It doesn't matter. I'm looking at your work. That's the first level of weeding. And we get that down to, you know, 20 or so. And then we go to the resume. And then we maybe think about where have you worked, what your experience level is, et cetera, who you say you are. We might interview uh, 10 people. Here's the way that goes. I block off a whole day or two. You can probably do five interviews in a day. I'm doing nothing else for that day. I'm not getting any of the work done or answering phone calls or emails. I'm in a room with you and then you and then you and then you. You all look the same to me. You're not the same, but I can't remember, oh, the guy in the pink sweater, oh, he did that thing, that really cool project, but no, that was actually the woman who's you know seven feet tall. The point is, your responsibility is to come in and tell a story about yourself so that I will absolutely know that you are the one who did this work, and here's why you did it, and here was your involvement, and here's why it was important to you, and here's why it solved the problem. And it's not about flipping through your book and saying, and then I did this, and then we did this student project, and then here's this thing. They all blend together, and believe me, if you're the seventh in a day, I'm tired. And it's four o'clock and you're tired, and I am confusing people. But if you tell me a story about you and your passion and why you are into design and, and most importantly why you are sitting across the table from me and why it has been your live stream to work for Metro, I will remember you and you'll probably get the job. Because by the time we're seeing seven people, all the work is good. But you have to blend in, you have to function within our little ecosystem and you need to be able to create stories, and if you can tell your story, then you can create stories.
really important, and I don't see that happening. I see a lot of page flipping and shyness, and yeah, then there was this, and then this, and then this, and I want to like grab people by their coat and say, who are you, you know? <laughs> what are you doing here? Why, do you, why, why should I care, you know? It's really important. Just one more, maybe, yeah? Um, well, thanks for the tip. Sure, good luck with that. <laughs> We're very. We actually are the design crew. There's a web crew. There's a signage crew. We're all behind the doors. All the creatives live and eat and you know burp together. And um, and we keep it that way. We actually report to different cost centers now. We've been split up once or twice and reorganized. We've always stayed where we are together because it doesn't matter where you are in the org chart or whatever. Creative people need to live together. And what we, you know, the web team is working on two or three different apps, but they need us to skin those in the Metro brand. You know, they're coding and they're using web, um, you know, developers, but you can't expect a web developer to be able to bring that voice in and the vocabulary and the icons or the photography or the things that make Metro Metro as a visual experience. So we're all very integrated in that way. You know, and signage is about voice. How, what's the least number of words that you could have on that sign? Does every word matter? How big, how small? You know, what is the, what's the accompanying color palette? All, all these things are really important and so we really work together on all that stuff. Um, everybody has value and it's more fun. You know, there's a, there's a certain sort of nerve-wracking thing if you're developing a signage program that is going to be on the expo line and it's going to be like a million dollars worth of signage. You actually really want that comfort of knowing that other people saw it, weighed in, feel good about it because now they're deputized to defend it, you know, as it, as it moves up the chain. Yeah. Oh, the tap card? Yeah. We did. No yeah, it's boring. Yeah. Oh, it's going. <laughs> Here's a tip. Buy another one in May at any ticket vending machine. I know it costs a buck. Um, and you will get, or, or on, on board a bus anywhere in LA County, and you'll get a commemorative Union Station 75th anniversary tap card. One of three that will spit out of the machine at random. So. <laughs> You got that, and they're limited edition. They'll last for about a month. We're 300,000 of them, but they'll be gone. And we are, we are redesigning that card. I actually know what it looks like. I just can't tell you. You'd have to kill me, of course. Um, but it's going to be better. That card is nine years old, and um, it's, it's high time. Nothing should last nine years, so I promise you it'll get better.